Some people say scholars choose their subjects. How did I go about choosing my subjects? It's probably more true for an academic that the subject chooses you. You're reading and something doesn't strike you as quite right. So for me, it quite frequently happens because I study the history of American constitutional development, is somebody says something that it should have been obvious to Roger Tawney, who was Chief Justice of the United States right before the Civil War, that slavery was very bad. And I think to myself, well, Tawney was a very smart man. Tawney, in other aspects of his life, was a very moral man. How could it be that a smart, moral man believe in slavery and believe the Constitution provided strong protections for slavery? And I find this fascinating to immerse myself in Roger Tawney's world, not to become part of it, but to understand why he believed what he believed, and then to understand why Abraham Lincoln believed what Lincoln believed. The best way to do historical research is immerse yourself in the primary documents. Read the newspapers. Read the letters. Read, for me, some of the court cases. And don't simply read the Mandarin big ones. Read the little ones. Get a sense of the way ordinary people thought. Start to speak their language. 19th century legal English isn't the same as 21st century English. Understand the monster means the Bank of the United States. Start to feel what are their words? What do they feel? And I find it fascinating. And I do have to say, though, when I'm doing early 20th century research and I read, say, the New York Times for July 15th, 1911. I always look also and find that how the Yankees do that day. In law, there is a major debate. It is probably the major debate of contemporary constitutional law between those who will call themselves originalists. A constitutional provision means what it was originally intended to mean and the living constitution, that the meaning of constitutional provisions changes over time. This debate does not tend to excite political scientists as much. And the reason why is most of us, liberal, conservative, or otherwise, believe change is inevitable. So we have a doctrine called interstate commerce. Congress can regulate interstate commerce. One day, a train comes along. A train enables you to transport goods quicker to more places than you could ever do before. For lawyers, the question becomes, well, how does the original meaning apply to trains? For political scientists, it's more the world changes, the constitutional order is going to change, that asking what George Washington would think about the internet and its implications for the First Amendment is asking what would George Washington think about the hula hoop and the designated hitter rule in baseball. Very few political scientists when compared to law professors are originalists. Now, there are some who think the court should stay originalist, which is basically the court should defer to Congress. But most people recognize Congress, at the very least, has to have changed understandings in light of changed times. So for example, the world is very different for presidential war powers when you have a nuclear bomb. What does the power to raise troops mean when most warfare now is fought by buttons? My research tends to focus on what was different about different eras. So a lawyer 
Someone once said, goes and looks for friends in history. So I am a lawyer, I'm pro-choice. I make arguments that James Madison was pro-choice. An article I'm working on right now wants to say that James Madison had an understanding of Republican government where the point of government was to elect the best people. And the best people are different from the most popular people. And my argument in the paper is that's not our understanding now. We don't have a sense of this person ought to be elected because they went to these schools, they had these qualifications. In a modern democracy, the most popular people hold office. It's a different form of government. And what I simply like to say is this would have made no sense to Madison. The standard political science understanding is we never really choose between the living constitution and strict construction, but between more desirable and less desirable living constitutions. Let me give you an example. The Fourth Amendment prohibits unreasonable searches. What is a search? When the Fourth Amendment was written, searches had to be physical. I physically entered your property and physically took something. Or I looked in through your window physically. Now I have an airplane. I don't come anywhere near your property, but I have some infrared technology and I look in and I can see everything going on. Is that a search? Constitution doesn't tell us. It simply says search. What we have to do is figure out what are the values embodied by the Fourth Amendment and under what values is that a search or not. But when we do this, inevitably, there are values and not James Madison's. One little project, though, I want to do is when we study different minority groups or disadvantaged groups, Equal Protection Clause doctrine tells us they're somewhat the same. So African Americans have it a lot worse than women. Women have it a lot worse than Jews. Jews have it a lot worse than some other group, but something the same. I'm starting a book called Different Differences, which is going to be a comparative history of African Americans and Jews in the United States. And it begins with a problem, and I'm going to not talk about the solution, because I want people to think, isn't this interesting? The first Jews and African Americans come to the Americas at about the same time, in the 1620s. When African Americans come, race is not a marker of status in Virginia. They're treated the same as poor whites, for the most part. When Jews come, the first thing that happens in New Amsterdam is they are slapped with every medieval restriction on Jews. Over the next 30 years, the African American community in Virginia will be enslaved. The Jewish community in New Amsterdam will be emancipated. Why did one community fare so much better than another? What does that say about the development of the United States? Those are the questions that seem to have found me, and I look forward to your students helping me with some answers. I went to college intending to be a political science major. I found the philosophy department as an undergraduate more exciting and actually wrote my undergraduate dissertation on the thought of an 11th century English nun or English monk. I then got scared about the job market in philosophy and went to law school, realized that was a mistake, went to philosophy grad school. At the time in grad school, there were more people in the political science department interested in what I was in. So I wound up at political science, getting a PhD, but the result of this is I don't 
see myself as having a part of my brain that's philosophy, a part that's political science, a part that is law. I'm interested in working in problems on the border between law, political science, philosophy, and my other love, history.